Welcome back to the Point of Order on the Cross-Border Interviews with Christopher Brown. I am your host, Christopher Brown, and I am pleased and honored to always have our guest host and our person who just loves to come back Wednesday night, Miss Sarah Biggs. Sarah, thank you so much for doing this once again. Thanks for having me once again. How are you? Uh, not too bad. Stampede is in full force. I am exhausted. I am trying to do as many events as possible to take some photos, to get some stories, but it is taking a toll on me. So I am taking tomorrow and I'm just relaxing. Uh, for those who are going to be tuning in, one fifteen, we are going to be going live with the leader of the People's Party of Canada, Mr. Honorable Maxime Bernier, will be live with us at one fifteen Mountain Standard Time tomorrow. So please check this. If you're listening to this later on, the audio version will be out later next week, but also go check it out. Please highly recommend. It's always, it's always have, you, have you seen my popcorn? Where's my popcorn? Your popcorn, my yes. Popcorn. A lot of people are surprisingly taking interest in this episode for some reason. The Twitter space is all a buzz about Maxime Bernier coming to Calgary and with everything going on federally with the Conservatives, they don't want to split the vote and have Justin Trudeau win another mandate and they want Maxime Bernier to get out. So we're going to talk to Maxime Bernier tomorrow about that. So tune in. It will be released later on next week. Just search Maxime Bernier in our list of... Uh, episodes but i want to start with the big thing the big thing that's happened federally around here and that is calgary stampede and every single uh, federal leader has been in this province besides the ndp we're going to talk about them a little bit later on but um traditionally you see the camp the leaders come into this province and put on their cowboy hats how how do you think the leaders did? How do you think Justin Trudeau and the many, 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 many campaign stops that the conservative <laughs> leadership candidates did? So uh, due to work obligations, I have attended a lot <laughs> of stuff party. And I'm assuming since a lot of them week. with some of the conservative leadership candidates. <laughs> so. Some, uh, but you know, we uh, I was doing a joke with Tasha Carrot, and we're like, "Hey, Sarah, nice to see you. What's up?" Since half hour ago, because everybody's just making the rounds in all the parties, right? It's all in the same circle, but moving venues. <laughs> um, I was at the the barbecue on Saturday night. Um, they did well. They did extremely well. How many people were there? Um, you say? Was that? How many people were there, do you believe? Would you say there's more than 150? Oh, I would say over a thousand. Oh, wow. Uh, the conservative would barbecue? Not. Yeah, I would say there was at least a thousand people in there. Um, there was some, uh, you know, uh, some were there, some weren't. Uh, got a chance to talk with Mr. Baber. I got an chance to talk with um, Mr. Charest's spouse, Michelle. She's a wonderful, wonderful lady. We we spoke in French for about half hour. It was a, it was a good time. She probably we, enjoyed speaking you know, in French in Alberta, probably. I know she is bilingual, so she is fluent in both languages, but yeah. it probably was a little bit of a reprieve for her. And she looked at me, she was like, your French is so not broken. She was like, are you, how long have you been here? I was like, well, 16 years. She was like, oh, but you know, it's it was good to see everybody just talking and being amicable, and you know, it always gets you know a little clicky once in a while. But it was it was a good reunion. So it was outside the conservative um, barbecue was outside, and it was really nice. I didn't go in the tent, listen to the speeches because some of them I really couldn't care less for. No. Um, but no. Well, you know, I had good conversation with Mr. Baber, Mr. Charest. Um, some of them were more recluded, a little bit more quiet. Um, but it was good. It was really, Did they really good. Their stamps, though, because at the end of the day, most of these people, uh, most of these candidates, know that they've sold their memberships and they're speaking to the party faithful. They're speaking to the people who've already converted. There's no memberships to sell. Was just no, just, just okay. punching their stamp to say, "Hey, look." We came to Calgary. We, we we did our due diligence. We 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 spoke it with our cowboy hat. Mr. Schrade did not have a cowboy. I think Roman didn't either, if I'm not mistaken. But after that, I'm ninety percent sure all but one left this province in like a cloud of like cartoonish smoke, 
when like that barbecue was over, they were on the next plane out the next morning to go to Vancouver, go back to Quebec. Um, this was just punching their card at the end of the day, right? It was a it was punching card, you know. Mr. Schwager was not. Uh, he was wearing his regular blue suit, his uh, notable blue suit. Uh, he didn't have his cowboy hat, and that's fine. I bought my first one this year. Uh, it doesn't make you less conservative, or, you know. Um, but it was good. The camaraderie was very collegial. It, it was nice. It was nice to, as people I haven't seen since two thousand six. Um, that you know came our way and uh, to party with us and you know just uh, networking with some conservatives from Toronto and there's a lot of people that were out of province that came to that barbecue um, and you know the parties it's it was it was good it's just you know um, I'm still surprised I have not caught COVID yet knock on wood um, because it was very crowded I'm very very surprised. <laughs> Well, I, I want to dive been... into this a little bit deeper, if we're okay with that, because yeah. I know we're not we're not going to be talking about the UCP leadership just for transparency for yeah. uh, reasons. Uh, Sarah is involved with the campaign, so we're just not going to be talking about that. But I want to talk about the attitude of Calgarians, because I'm assuming you saw this, I saw this, but uh, there was media reports that. Justin Trudeau came to this province and was heckled while up in Calgary Skyview. I was at the event. There was one person who was heckled, who was heckling um, Prime Minister Trudeau while I was there. Um, we did not get that on camera. If we did, we would have uploaded that because we want to make sure we're transparent and all there. But there was a heckler. He did say, traitor, traitor, and then his security surprisingly wished him off very quickly. I went to the Calgary... Oh, I'm always going to get, I always get this name of the writing wrong. Calgary, uh, it's not Falcon Ridge. Oh, my God. Jazz Raj Hollins, Singh Hollins writing. I, I I can't believe I'm forgetting that right now. Uh, it's just south of Calgary Skyview. Um, I went to his event, and I can tell you that I, I estimated there was about 600 people there. I was con yeah. It was confirmed that there was actually over 4,000, and that was from Mr. Holland's uh, mouth himself because I met him at the Premier's uh, breakfast on Monday, and he said his people had counted, and there was over 4,000, so I'm always willing to make say that I made a mistake. It's Calgary Falcon Ridge, my no. friend. It's Sorry. Not, is it Falcon Ridge? Or Calgary McCall. No, that's provincial. You're, you're, you're looking provincially right now. Oh, I'm looking provincial. <laughs> Screw that up. It's so okay. I'm tired. No, it's, it's one of those days. So I was at that event, and <laughs> I will be honest. I'm going to put it on the table here. The conservative event was very well run. There was, like, you lined up for your pancakes. They gave speeches. No one, like, rushed to the front of the stage to listen to these speeches. Most people were there yep. to eat pancakes on a Saturday morning um, or, yeah, Saturday morning of the first Saturday of uh, Stampede. The Skyview event, full transparency here, I ran for the Liberals. I, I, I had Mr. Chahal on the, on the show during the election as a municipal councillor, as a uh, li Liberal candidate. I got accosted six times while I was at that event by saying, who are you? Why are you here? What are you doing here? Uh, well, I'm in your writing. I'm here to take photos and I'm here to cover it. Well, did you register as press? No, because no one told me that I had to register as press. When I was yeah. at the conservative event, fuck. Like, the conservatives were like, hey, come over here. Take this photo. Take this photo. I was like, okay, unofficial photographer. But I enjoyed myself a lot more at the conservative event. And that's coming from me because I try to be transparent. I try to be open and honest. Yeah. But do conservatives just have more fun at Stampede? Is that what it's all about? Because we saw the media releases that Justin Trudeau was mobbed in Skyview. Okay, uh, there was a lot of people at that event. There was not 4,000 people at that event. Anyone could mob the prime minister because when you have a small area, you're going to be packed in and you're going to be wanting a photo. But people were mobbing Pierre Polyev, uh, John Charest, but the media just didn't cover that. But it goes back to my original question. Do conservatives just have more fun at these events, at these uh, stampede events, because it is in their backyard? 
not just at stampede events you know when when i when i was not one we we always knew how to throw a good party um <laughs> um, but you know I think we're a little bit more lax I would say a little bit more relaxed um, but there's also we need to understand that uh, the political climate we're in right now is not necessarily favorable to the premier uh, to the prime minister apologies premier Kenny um, and we need to uh, you know we need to be cognizant of that you know the circle is going to be a little tighter around the liberal leader right now there were snipers um, there. Because... there were snipers on the roof of the genesis center first time in my life i've ever seen snipers in person and it was very shocking to be honest yeah so uh, like i said it's a different political environment very 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 different uh, we cannot, you know, ignore the threats that are being put out there every day. Politicians deal with threats and it's just plainly horrible. And, you know, people just, just stop really get, get a life. Get, get, you go, go start knitting or something. Keep your hands busy. Like threats are not helping for proper political debate and discussions, but, but you know, given the environment, given that, uh, in Berta right now, and given the events, um, yeah, security has been pretty tight around the uh, the prime minister. Like, and I don't blame them. RCP is taking extra caution, and I don't blame PMO for being extra cautious as well, right? But if you remember, like five two thousand fifteen, it was not like that. But it's just, you know, in twenty fifteen, I remember Trudeau just walking into a bar. And grabbing a beer, saying hi to everybody, walking out, and you know that's it. Um, I I think it's a good show of how bad the political discourse is right now in the country and how divided we are, um, because there are people out there making threats, and unfortunately, they need to take bigger actions. The the reason I say this, and the reason I opened up with the transparency part, is because I'm going to talk a little bit about the premier's uh, pancake breakfast on Monday. Um, the, yeah. the premier of Alberta, Jason Kenney, had an event on Monday morning, which it's an annual tradition during Stampede, where the premier hosts a uh, pancake breakfast while they're at McDougal's uh, place or at Olympic Plaza, Olympic Olympic Plaza, one or the other. So it's in the general area of downtown Calgary. Now, mm -hmm. I, I went to the event. I, I, I saw what was there. There was protesters there as well. I will be up front with that. There's a protester who was saying that uh, electricity rates are too high. There was a protester saying that Jason Kennedy needs to step down today uh, like because he's just putting off the inevitable. There, are, there were protesters there who were saying, keep our, like, don't mine in our Rocky Mountain, so on and so forth. But there was no, uh, what's the word I want to say? There was no press coverage of that protest. Yeah. But the, the, the somewhat media uh, would say that we need to cover the fact that there was protesters in the Liberal event, but not at the Jason Kenney event. Is there a double standard now when it comes to conservatives versus liberals, depending on where your media lies? That's a good and tough question. That's why we, that's why we have you on to answer these good and tough questions. Because I think, I'm gonna you know, this, I'm going to say this because I've been re this is this is this is going to show you where <coughs> my mind's been going for the last few weeks. I try to read as much as possible, and I try yeah. to read from different perspectives because I need to learn. That's why I have this show. I want to have people on so I can learn from where they're coming from. So I read True North Center, I read uh, The Rebel, I read Toronto Star, I read the Tr at Calgary Herald. I read a cross-section of what is out there because it only does me good to inform my viewers and my listeners what's going on if I can have the knowledge to back it up. I didn't see much in the realm of there were protesters at the Jason Kenney event because and we're in Calgary and I understand that it's a more conservative area but there was nothing about the protesters even though global was there western standard was at the event I was there uh, there was CBC there and none of them covered the protests there but Twitter and all that sh 
shit, pardon my French, just didn't care that there was protesters there. They wanted more to jump on Trudeau. I think it's because Trudeau's dealing with a lot of anti-vaxxers right now and with the convoys and everything that's been happening. I think the attention is more, um, has shifted on, you know, what's happening to Trudeau, right? Um, we have a lame duck premier right now. So he is, you know, in somewhat caretaking mode and he will be gone by October 6th. Um, but it, it all depends on what kind of protesters you're getting, right? Of course, if you're getting like Trudeau, who's pro, uh, you know, mandates, vaccine, you, you know, he really tried to do his best. A lot of people disagree with him. And we had uh, events of quite national, you know, they, they were national events. And I think that that makes better media than somebody that, that goes says, hey, please don't go mine in my mountain. Well, and I, I agree with you. Um, I got to the premier's event about 7 o'clock when it was supposed to start. I think I got there about 6.30 because I'm always one of those people. You arrive a half hour early just in case you miss the good stuff, right? And there was a yeah. guy yelling traitor at Jason Kenney or yelling at, yelling at the mainstream media, as he put it, and saying, why aren't you covering him being here, so on and so forth. And understandable people have the right to protest peacefully as long as they don't hurt anyone. I don't give two craps. I just want I want I want uh, both sides of the story, right? If you're gonna say that there was protesters at Trudeau's event, you better well damn say there was protesters at the uh, premier's event. Now I will say this: there was not one protester that I heard or saw at the Calgary, whatever you call it. I, I want to say Confederation, but it's not that. It's gonna bother me for the next one. Mr. Jazz Ra Raj Holland Singh, uh, his campaign uh, event. Uh, on Saturday, there was no, there was no protesters there. So there was no protesters with uh, Pierre Polyev. It was a civil event, and I'm not sure if that was well known or widely spoke about because I and Global were the only two people in attendance at that event. Just to put that out there, <laughs> I. I you know, anti-vaxxers and Trudeau's a conspiracy theorist is more is sexier. It's Calgary Forest Lawn, by the way. Forest Lawn, there you go. Took me, Sorry, took me. I, I was picking it up. Uh, you know, anti-vaxxers and you know, um, everything the all the you know the commotion around Trudeau is way more sexier news-wise than somebody is upset because. You know, and the government wants to go and please don't take it as I'm pro coal mining and don't agree with it. I no, but it doesn't make as good news as somebody who's yelling insult to the prime minister. Let's put it that way. No, and I agree. It's just I, I, I wanted to start off with this because I it, it always bothers me whenever I see if you're going to say that there's protesters or if you're going to say one thing for somebody, you better well damn say it for somebody else if it happens. So that's my two cents. We'll leave it at that because we probably could go on for another hour about this because yeah. media media issues are very much something that I it bothers me all the time. And I just hope to God that there's people out there who are potentially going to listen to this or watch this and say, you know what, we need to make sure two birds, one stone. The next area that I want to talk about is the one that came out of Ottawa this morning, and that is from the Bank of Canada. The interest rate, the Bank of Canada governor announced that they were increasing the uh, uh, interest rates to, I think, 100 percent points, which is going to bring it up to 2 percent. This is a massive, massive increase. This has not happened since 1998. Um, this is this is going to potentially cause a lot of struggles for a lot of people, particularly already in this uh, uncertain economic time. Uh, yeah. Is this a big story that people should be watching or is it a story that was foreseeable coming with everything that was going on with our interest rates so high and our uh, inflation going up through the roof? <sighs> My banker called me last week. She was like, hey, Sarah, you know, one mortgage I have fixed, the other mortgage, um, because I have two properties. Um, the second mortgage is on a variable. She was like, do you want to lock in at 
75 or something. I was like, why? <laughs> why? I was like, even with the increase, I'm not going to pay as much on a variable, but you know, it does make a difference. You know, like my mortgage on, <coughs> sorry, that piece of property is fairly, you know, small. I'm not going to feel it that I'm not going to feel it that much. Um, but people that I would say that there's a lot of people, you know, during the boom or during the, the, the bubble overextended themselves um, and purchase for more than what they could really afford. So those are the ones I'm worried about because, you know, on a six, on a $600,000 mortgage, uh, it could mean 150 to two to $300 a month in increase, right? So, and with people we shall see. who are two hundred dollars away from being bankrupt or each month, and uh, an additional cost is always something that you have to look a bit uh, worried about. Okay. There's always the you know the proverbial debate of should we throw more money in the economy? No, we should not. And that's not going to be you know, and the, the governments and you know we're going to have to to look at real solutions, not just printing checks and sending them out. Uh, no insult to everyone, but, you know, we, we, people need more than, you know, financial, we need to find ways and the, the systems that we have in place, we are able to find ways and find where we can help and how it would impact next week, the taxpayer. And the government has the power to do that. Um, fifty dollars a month for electricity. Sure, okay, cool. My condo is gonna cost like I'm gonna get a fifteen dollar return every month. Okay, cool. Um, but you know, there's a lot of people that you know. I we and we gotta make sure that we're helping the right people as well, because for some people, that's if you know, if we're giving seventy five or a hundred bucks or a hundred and fifteen bucks, I gotta be like, oh sweet, we're just gonna go out for dinner, right? But if you help, if you help where people need the most help in a meaningful way, that's where you're going to have a bigger impact. Because at the end of the day, uh, 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 I'm walking a very fine line right now with the leadership. No, and I know. So I'm just going to, I'm going to jump around here. For trying to, so no, but at, at the end of the day, you know, we just got to make sure that we're so I'm, I'm going to say this. We'll I'm going to go back to federal right now because this is a federal yeah. issue. This is this. It is a Canada, federal The issue. Bank of Kansas interest rates is not a provincial issue. Let's put that nope. on the table right now. It affects the interests of provincial parties, but at the end of the day, it's a, per, a federal issue. My question mm -hmm. is, and this has been, I know this has been rumblings on Twitter, and you should always take Twitter with a fine tooth comb, but does, yeah. does Justin Trudeau need to change the Minister of Finance? Is Christia Freeland now officially in over her head when she's coming out saying, we're trying to make it better for you. We're going to re-announce the things that we've already announced. Like, to me, and this is nothing against Christia Freeland because she's probably a very, she is a very smart woman. I would probably want her to run for the leadership of the party. I don't, I don't know if I want her to win, but she probably will. But does Justin Trudeau need to get a better communicator in that position to say, you know what? We need someone who's actually going to communicate what the hell the government's doing and not just sit there and try to explain it like a Rhodes Scholar. I, I think they need to take back control mm -hmm. of their narrative and really starting showing really meaningful new initiatives. Like, I couldn't tell you one thing that it's, the government's doing to make our lives easier. And that... And, and that, I, pay, I, I pay attention to politics. Like, I, I read, eat politics 18 hours a day. You know, but what I'm seeing about the, the federal government, I don't see much. Um, and it's very unfortunate because, you know, you and I are, you know, that's all we do. It's like, hey, did you see this? Hey, did you see that? Oh, my God. What do you think, you know, it's, this, it, this is my work. My work is to look at what policies are being put out there and trying to translate it and put into everyday, you know, try to to see what it means for every everyday Albertans. That's literally my job. 
on every level. And, you know, the federal's just been dropping the ball yeah. over and over and over again. And it needs, hey, I think that Mr. Trudeau's gusto is, he's done. He needs to go. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying I'm a liberal or conservative, but each leader has its time. It's been seven years. The cycle is coming to an end. Um, but that's sorry, what they said my about Kathleen is... Wynne too, right? That's what they said about Kathleen Wynne. It was coming to well, an look end. Look at Harper. And he left after leadership. nine years. Yeah, well, Harper left after nine years. I don't like, think he left. He more got kicked to the curb by Justin Trudeau, just to be. Yeah, but his cycle was over after but nine years. Like, I, I think it becomes we'll the question, besides fired. John Horgan and besides John Horgan, do leaders even go, like, do, do the leaders even know when their best before date is? Because you're seeing a lot of people who run in these elections and then go, well, we didn't win, so I, I'm gone. Aaron O'Toole, we saw Jason Kenney because his best before date was probably going to be a little bit later. It's now pushed on. John Horgan saying, okay, I'm going to keep on. Aaron O'Toole, he thought his best before date was next election, but the party said nope. Uh, Andrea Horvath, her mm -hmm. best before date, she was going to try and win this. Oh, she's election. been there for a long time. Yeah, exactly. Do do party leaders even know when their best before date is and they or do they just care about power? Some do. Mr. Horgan's situation is slightly different than the other leaders. Um, you know, for he's got who don't know, he was diagnosed with cancer. He came back after I think he did two rounds of treatments. Um, I, I feel bad for him. He did say that this has nothing to do with that. I'm not saying that it does or it would, but I'm saying it, it takes a toll on you, right? And you know, he's it. Well, you know, it, it takes a toll on you. So you know, the uh, good for him. Like uh, he could have stayed a little longer. Sorry, my cat is literally trying to jump to climb on my chair oh, right now. Okay. Right my dog's here. licking my like, leg right now saying, let's go outside. So it's just one of those, one of those animal <laughs> episodes. <laughs> so uh, he likes his mom. So uh, going, back but no. the, going back to the original statement, we, we can talk about Trudeau, yeah. but do you think Christia Freeland needs to be moved into a new yes. portfolio and put she in a new Yes, she needs to meet her. As put her, I, keep her as the deputy prime minister, that's fine. That's give fine. Her, like, intergovernmental affairs or something. Something she can give go her talk international. To. Put her back into international relations because I strongly believe that Melanie Jolie should not be sitting in that chair. They made a huge mistake yesterday with Ukraine. Huge. Yeah. Um, you know, Melanie Jolie. She's an extremely smart lawyer. She's a great politician, but does she belongs where she is right now? I. You'd have to give me a lot of money to start believing that. So I wasn't going to, uh, I forgot about what happened with Ukraine this week. Um, I want it's to about talk, a, if you're okay with yeah. chat about it for a few seconds, because yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is a bigger issue than I think it's going This is going to tarnish the reputation of Canada on the world stage, I think. And that's, that's me saying this. I know that the uh, Secretary of State for the United States did come out yesterday with a letter saying we support Canada in giving this in giving the turbine back to uh, Russia so that way they can uh, give the oil to Germany. But this is a massive mistake on Canada's part, is it not? And I say that with all due respect because I, I, I'm no foreign affairs expert. Uh, we have been flying the Ukraine flag for the last four or five months since Russia invaded the country. And now we are supposed to sit here and go, okay, we don't like Russia, but we're going to give Russia back what it wants so that way Russia can supply oil and gas to Europe and you turn around and oh. use that money towards the war in Ukraine. Yeah, but see, it, it's not even the fucking problem right now. We have Trudeau, Trudeau being like, we're sending arms, we're sending arsenals, we're sending everything that we have. And then he turns around and like, hey, yeah, bring us your, your turbine, we'll fix it. You can't have the cake and eat it at the same time. And that's the issue right now. You can't make them believe that it's the hardest decision in your life. I'm going to compare it to Mr. Kenny's article this week saying 
he just wanted a normal life. He really just wanted to, he didn't, didn't really want him to have that, that job. Sorry. But you know, when it's his goodbye exit interview, right? Um, poor me, poor me, pity party kind of Twitter tatter. But to go back to Trudeau, like say that it's a difficult decision as much as you want. At the end of the day, it's full of poop and it stinks. And that is, and I'm wondering who made the final call. But because, you know, we know that Ukraine is weaponizing their national resources to leverage their war in Ukraine. We know that Germany is going to have to rely on coal next winter to heat their houses. I'm going to have families impacted by that in Europe. Um, but, you know, really giving them that, it's either in, in this particular case, it's either you're in or you're out. You can't be in the middle and be like, no, that's okay. We'll fix it for you. No problem. Just don't tell too many people. Like, you know, it's like uh, working for cash, right? And it has the same implications. It's like under the table and it's like, yeah. I, I agree wholeheartedly. And an exemption of two years, like they're full of poop. I'm sorry. I. It's Joel bullshit. Lee has not been out in front of the cameras this entire last four days. It's been Trudeau been wearing this. Um, I don't know if this is over the head for Melanie, but or the for uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs. But if if this is what their foreign policy now looks like, dear God, I don't want it to ever look like this ever again. There's Jesus takes a wheel. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Um, the last topic I want to talk about here before we start wrapping up is the federal yeah. party that has not been really doing much lately. And I'm not sure if it's Which because, one? because we're in Alberta or if it's because... The conservatives with solar panels or the orange ones? Which well, one? Let, well, let's talk about both of them for a few minutes here, if you don't mind, because there is a leadership race coming up for the Green Parties, and we'll talk about that in a few seconds. But I want to talk about the NDP. Mm -hmm. Jagmeet Singh has been MIA on the federal scene. He has been putting out his tweets. He has been doing his Burnaby at, uh, rotations in Surrey and all that. But he has not been making that much rounds when it comes to federal policies. And the summer barbecue circuit is when you get out and you go talk to people. What the hell is going on with the NDP right now federally? Is it, it am I missing it or is it just something that people aren't even caring about anymore? <laughs> say it. He's say done. It. He needs to go. See he needs, needs to go. To we need a revamp of our leaders. That's what I say. But we if, need like, we need fresh blood. Need, go ahead. I've seen too many leaders over the past 20, 19 years <laughs> going you're, through. You're only 26? Wow. I know, right? <clears throat> US. <laughs> I, but, I don't know what but, the strategic move is here for the NDP. Like there's I, no strategy anymore. Like I look at everything right now, you know, I, I like strategy. I, I do strategy. I, you know, I kind of know a little bit about strategy, but there's no strategy anymore. It's like, if the NDP is like, fuck it. Like we, we signed the agreement with the libs. They're going to be fine for a few years. It's just, we're on for the summer. See you later. We'll, we'll, we'll check back in like in six months. But like, where's their even fundraisers that they're hosting? Because Last year, Jagmeet Singh came to Alberta and he did his rounds at Calgary Stampede because I went up to his event in Calgary Skyview. Yet again, there was speculation of a campaign coming up in the next few weeks, so he was out crisscrossing. Is, is, are the NDP aware of something that we aren't? Because it seems like there's no fire under their ass right now to get out and connect with voters. And I say that on June, July 13th, 2022, there may be an event to this weekend in Calgary that at the Calgary Stampede that I'm not aware of, 
But right now, as it stands, the only parties that are actually hosting things are the Conservatives, the Liberals, the Mavericks, and the People's Party, because Maxine's coming to Alberta. He's sitting down tomorrow, and then Saturday... He's and the NDP's been party. around, though. The ND- I've seen the NDP all week. All week. Provincially, yeah. yes. Provincially, sure. But- yeah, but... My dude, the NDP on the federal level has never mingled with anyone else. And that's what we need. Like, I remember when Jack Layton was on the Hill. I miss Jack so much. Um, I think a you lot know, we of have, Canadians uh, miss Jack right now. Like, remember um, the days when we had actual good leaders? When we had Stephen Harper, when we had Paul Martin, when we had Jack Layton? Where are the days? Even John you Christian. Know, John Kitsian was a great prime minister, great prime minister. And was so was Martin. And, you know, and then you got Nyanya. That's how we called Ignatiev on the, on the hill. We were calling him Nyanya. But, uh, you know, uh, and conservatives and liberals always mingled in the evenings. And, you know, we're always talking about that. But never, ever, ever, ever would we see... Um, an NDP or a block staffer hanging out with us ever. So it's not from, it's not new that they're not participating. They're only participating because they're trying to win a goddamn election. And they're trying to score brownie points and showing up with solar panels and they're like, woo, we're shiny. Well, but speaking of solar panels, the Green Party of Canada <laughs> is holding a leadership race here. And uh, I, I mean that with all respect because I think some of the Green Party policies, there are some that are actually well if thought out and formed. I just hope that there's a leader that could actually put the coherent sentence together and actually talk to the average Canadian and not have a party in fight like last time. Um, so we have a federal conservative leadership race where there is a entrance fee of $100,000, if I'm not mistaken, give or take $25,000 here or there. I, I don't know the exact amount, but it's a pretty hefty uh, amount. We have a provincial UCP leadership, which is 175000 I've never seen a party who has had a nomination fee of $1,000. $1,000 to run to be the leader of the Green Party. You have to have memberships sold and nomination uh, signatures in certain ridings to certain percent in each riding. You have to be able to speak and uh, write in French and English on a scale that the European Union uses. I don't know why we're using that, but it's standard across the world, so you need to do that. The Green Party of Canada, <laughs> surprise, surprise, has garnered a lot of interest for this leadership race. Are you shocked at A, the first, how low the amount is to enter the race, and B, the interest that it has uh, coming up on the actual race? Because most people thought the Green Party was dead last election. Yeah, but the, 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 Elizabeth May keeps it alive all the time, right? Until she's really retired. Elizabeth is like the anti that makes sure that the, the ship is steady and keep direction um but Do you, you think know people are gonna pay attention because people like you I won't. Will probably be, you won't i don't you better because we've got confirmation for four of the candidates who are taking the nomination I will. coming I, on this show I will. <laughs> uh, i'm just so busy like i gotta worry about my own death race but uh, a thousand dollars. Wait, they could say that they want to make it, you know, um, affordable to everyone. They could spend that. There's a few ways you could spend it. Uh, we're a party of the people. We want to make sure that the process is fair to everyone. Got to make sure you're selling memberships, and got to make sure that the full exercise of, um, you know, democracy is being uh, executed. We we could put it that way because, you know, if you look at 175 in Alberta. Um, let me tell you, fundraising for that money is not something that's like, woo. Um, but if it was $1,000, you'd see a lot more people in this race, I would assume. Well, Bill Rock would have not dropped. 
I was a little sad that Mr. Rockjaw. Mm -hmm. I like, I, I like Mr. Well, Rock. Going back to the bringing... green party because Chinese wall, Chinese wall. Yeah, uh... Chinese. <laughs> so, it's you know what they Do have people, a race. Are people paying attention them? to the Green Party right now? Because mm -hmm. I see the Twitter and I'm not seeing a lot of chatter going on. And Anna it's and one Kutner... thing electing a leader. It's one thing electing a leader, but it's another thing getting a leader elected in an election. There are two different things and two very different strategies. And it applies to every single level of government. You know, you can have the great leader. You're like, yeah, let's do this. And then you're like, oh, shit. Well, you know, the, the rest of the people won't be voting for them. Um, you know, the, 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 the Green Party has been on the respirator for, I would say, at least four years. At least. And, you know, I love Elizabeth May. She's the auntie in the house that gives us a little slap behind the head when, you know, we're not behaving. But at the end of the day... And she always, she always knows respect. her parliamentary, uh, parliamentary privileges and parliamentary Oh, she power. did. <laughs> God she bless is that woman. very, very... I love that woman for that. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, we need to commend them for... Um, you know, keeping the process alive and keeping the party alive. And all we can do, you know, you know, sometimes I make fun, I say they're conservative with solar panels and it's like, but it's true. But, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we need to respect our processes and, you know, case okay, sarah, sarah, and they're going to be on the ballot. And if they can pull out more members, well, good for them. If they can get more votes, good and for them. It's part of it. Go ahead. It's like the rhinoceros party, right? I love that party so much. Some of their candidates are fantastic. But it's just, it's an exercise of democracy. And we need to be very thankful to be able to exercise it. I would love to have the leader of the rhinoceros party back, uh, on the show. Because my, my first introduction to the rhinoceros party was way back in Ontario when I was a journalist and I was going through university. And I remember reading their platform. It was fe a federal election. I think it was the 24, 2004 election or 2006 election. And I was reading their platform. And they're one that always has stuck out to me for some strange reason. And, and no disrespect to these people. But they, they, they announced that they were going to pave the entire province of Manitoba and make it into a parking lot. And I just thought to myself... If that's what your platform is, I commend you for even running a candidate in Manitoba. Because how do you go tell people, hey guys, I need you to move out because we're turning this into a parking lot. They're, they're fantastic. And they then the other are. one was, we're gonna move the auto, we're gonna move our capital from Ottawa to Victoria. So that like Victoria. When I was a little girl. Like, I don't know, seven or eight in so the like Critchie. 20 years era. ago, right? 18, 18. 18 years um, Yeah, 18. Um, in the Critchie era, I remember getting a flyer from the Renaissance Party, and they were, they, they put some pictures of par people doing some levitation meditation. And I remember my brother and I had a good giggle about it because uh, that that's one of my, you know, it's a good childhood memory. And my mom's like, they're absolutely insane. And though, but you know, when you look at it, when you look back at it, it's like, it's great humor. And sometimes when it's very, very heavy. And I think the, the um, uh, rhinoceros party is like the funny uncle that tries to keep the jokes going. Hey, I, so. I love them. They reign federally out here. We got some of their buttons from a, a great candidate out in Calgary, wherever Len Weber's riding is on the on the east side of the city or on the west side of the city. Um, but it, okay, God bless them. God bless the Green Party. I hope they do have a fantastic leadership race. I'm looking forward to sitting down with a lot of these candidates because well, it's going to be fun. Be it will. It, it will. will. Always fun. But with that, 
It has been almost 45 minutes, and we try to keep this under an hour just to make sure that we can go take a nap, but check in with each other. Um, Sarah, thank you so much for doing this once again. Always a pleasure to have you on the show to talk about politics and the biggest news stories of the week, and we probably missed some if we did. Send us a message and we'll file it. No, I'm, I think I might do the show. So I'm on vacation. Uh, hold on, somebody's calling me. Uh, <laughs> Work the choice of, of a campaign. contractor is never done. I'm going to say this. We will be back for one more episode before we both take a uh, much needed hiatus for two weeks and then we'll be back in August. Yes. Uh, I was going to say we should do it when I'm in Vegas. I should have done it from the strip. Do it. Let's do it. Then we can talk about American politics and the Canadian politics. So with that, Sarah, enjoy your vacation. We will. I will be back next week. Sarah might not be. We might I'll be back be. next week. Okay. I'm here. The following two weeks, I'm... Okay. So next week is our last week because the week after I'm gone for my birthday week, and then the week after that is something else. Um, but we will be back after uh, uh, in seven days with another great point of order on the cross board interviews with Chris Brown and Sarah Biggs. Uh, so with that, have yourself an excellent day, everyone. And remember, get out from behind social media. Go have the conversation with somebody. And if you show up to protest, you better well make sure all the media hears you so that way they can cover it properly. Talk to you later, everyone. <laughs>